Studio Ghibli's portfolio of feature films is a goldmine. Many people have seen Ghibli's classics like Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro, but as of 2022, there are actually 23 movies in the Ghibli library, and unless you're a hardcore fan, you probably haven't seen them all. You might not even have heard of some of them. Well, that was the category I was in up until fairly recently, when I decided to finally dive in and watch all of the Ghibli films I'd never seen before, and wow, I was not expecting to uncover so many incredible films, particularly by the other Ghibli directors that aren't Hayao Miyazaki. So now that I really have seen them all, it's only natural for me to want to sort them into tears, both because I have an unexplainable desire to rank the media that I consume, and because I want to highlight some of the lesser known films that should be on everyone's watch list. Before we get into the ranking themselves, I need to do a quick preamble to explain how I'm going to do this. In terms of what counts as a Ghibli movie, that part's pretty simple. I'll be tearing every feature length film animated by Studio Ghibli plus Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which has been treated as an official Ghibli film by the studio even though it came out prior to the studio's founding, so it counts. But nothing else before then does. Sorry to the Castle of Cagliostro fans out there. In terms of dubs, unless I specifically mention it, I'm ranking these films based on their official English dub. For a whole heap of reasons, I generally recommend that non-Japanese speakers should watch Ghibli films with the English dub. The vast majority of them are excellent, and there's so much going on visually that it's a real shame to put most of your attention on the subtitles. As I talk about these films, I'll be mentioning a standout scene from each one, and there will be some very mild spoilers, but I promise not to talk about anything that might negatively impact your enjoyment of the film. Now something I really want to emphasize is that I'm going to be sorting all the Ghibli films into tiers by comparing each film to all the other Ghibli films, so this isn't an objective tier list. If I put a film in mid-tier, I'm saying it's mid for Studio Ghibli, not for all films as a whole. In my opinion, even the bad Ghibli films are a lot better than most regular films. Of course, this whole video is just my opinion, so if I say something you strongly disagree with me on, and I will, don't take it too personally. My tier system is the same one I use for music and it's always served me well. So starting in the middle, mid-tier is for films that have as many good aspects as bad aspects. They're not so bad that I'm willing to call the whole film bad, but they're also not good enough for me to fully endorse them. If a film is so bland that I don't have any strong thoughts on it, it usually ends up in mid-tier too. Low-tier films might have occasional bright spots, but are mostly disappointments. I'm not going to try and convince you to watch these, even though I still have a weird love for some of them. Shit tier is a step beyond bad. This tier is for films that aren't just bad films, they actually make the world a worse place just for existing. And spoiler alert, there are no Ghibli films in this category. I'm just keeping it on the board to remind you how low the scale goes. Looking at the upper half of the scale, in high tier we have films that probably have some weak points, but overall are great and I can fully endorse them. Top tier is for films where the highs are elevated even higher and the lows are almost non-existent. As you can see, it's not actually the top tier because I have God tier above it, and this is really just here for me to separate out my personal favourites. To get into God tier, a film has to impact me in a way that I can't explain and can never forget. Okay, we're finally ready to start and we're going to look at each film in release order, which means first up is Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind from 1984. A lot of the people who worked on this film ended up joining Studio Ghibli, so that's why it's usually included in the catalogue, despite the studio itself technically not existing yet. This was Hayao Miyazaki's second feature film as director, but the first one based on an original story, actually a manga he had started in 1982 and wouldn't finish until 1994. If you like this movie, lucky you, because the manga is much longer and more detailed. Although his first film, The Castle of Cagliostro, had featured some of Miyazaki's trademark themes, it's really in Nausicaa that we get a complete set of what I'm going to call the Big Five Miyazaki tropes, which are 1. Environmental and pacifist themes 2. Flying 3. A capable female protagonist 4. A sympathetic antagonist and 5. Wise elders Nausicaa looks incredible. The animation throughout this film is jaw-dropping, even 38 years later. In particular, the insects, which I'm phobic of by the way, are brought to life so vividly you can instantly buy into this world really existing. The character designs you see in this movie are so strong they would get shamelessly reused over and over again in subsequent films with only the barest of changes. My pick for a standout scene is the brief but terrifying attack of the giant warrior. This scene was animated by future Neon Genesis Evangelion director Hideaki Anno, and it's not hard to tell. The unsettling combination of the robotic and the organic makes a big impact, even at the climax when we've just seen a whole movie's worth of eye-popping scenes. 
for me, this movie is an easy top tier. Not long after the release of Nausicaa, Miyazaki officially founded Studio Ghibli alongside two other people, his mentor and fellow director Isao Takahata, and producer Toshio Suzuki. Now they would be free to make the films they wanted to make without any interference from the higher-ups, so long as their films made enough money to keep the bills paid. They immediately started work on a film that had a suspicious resemblance to the TV show Miyazaki directed in the late 70s, Future Boy Conan. Laputa Castle in the Sky was released in 1986 and is a refinement of all the things we saw in Nausicaa. This time the script is sharper, the animation more action-packed, and the whole thing feels like it might have been inspired by the recently released Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. This film feels much more like a proper blockbuster. And unusually for Miyazaki, there is a genuinely evil villain, the slimy Musker, voiced to perfection by Mark Hamill in the dub. Although, the villain from the first act, Captain Dola, does get the classic Miyazaki villain redemption treatment. The score is by Joe Hisaishi, who returns after scoring Nausicaa, and it mixes in traditional orchestrations with some more adventurous electronic music. Be aware though that on some releases, the original score is replaced by a modern symphonic re-recording. It sounds great too, but I like the mid-80s vibe of the original. The English dub, despite it featuring Mark Hamill, does have some issues though. Our main characters, Patsu and Cheetah, are supposed to be 12, 13-ish, but their voice actors play them as if they're older teenagers, and it kind of reframes their relationship as being much more romantic than maybe it's supposed to be. There are some other dodgy choices in the script that don't reflect the original intent of the Japanese version. I haven't actually seen the Japanese dub for Laputa, but I'm willing to bet it's really good, and possibly better than the English one. Most people would tell you that the standout scene in this is where the kids discover the ancient Laputian robot, but my pick goes to any of the early scenes featuring Patsu's Canyonside mining village. It's an extremely memorable setting that's just close enough to a real place that you can believe it exists. Back in the day, I would have put this above Nausicaa, but after re-watching them both recently, I think I like Nausicaa better, even though this is a more technically accomplished film. This one's a high tier. Ghibli's next release was a double feature, and we finally get an appearance by the studio's more reclusive co-founder, Isao Takahata. Unfortunately, this particular combination of films is probably one of the worst ever to watch back-to-back, -back, regardless of order. First, let's talk about Takahata's Ghibli debut, the soul-destroying Grave of the Fireflies. There are a few movies well-known for being ones that you watch once, admit that they are indeed great, and then never watch again. This is absolutely one of those movies. I watched it in 2015, and I'm still years away from feeling the need to put myself through it once more. Compared to Miyazaki, it's harder to sum Takahata up in a handful of tropes that he reliably uses in each of his films. If you're not familiar with Takahata, it's because he's the kind of guy that you can't really get familiar with. He's older than Miyazaki, more experienced, and by 1988 was kind of done with making nice, straightforward films that you can make a catchy trailer for. As you can imagine, this didn't exactly mesh well with Ghibli's very real need to produce commercial, marketable films that would keep the team employed. The number of times that Takahata almost bankrupted Ghibli is almost equal to the number of films he made with them. Takahata's style is detached and cold, it's unknowable, and in this film it feels dangerous. With Miyazaki, you can generally be sure of what you're not going to see, but with Takahata, you can never be sure. Grave of the Fireflies is one gut punch after another. Set in Tokyo in the final months of World War II, we see in harrowing detail what it was like for those who managed to escape the deadly rain of firebombing that wiped out most of the city. Most movies would climax with the city's destruction and end with the reveal that the brother and his young sister have triumphantly survived, but in this movie, that's the start. What happens next is hard to watch. The standout scene for me is the very last scene, where we get a snap time skip to modern day, and we, the presumably Japanese audience, are forced to reckon with the lives we live now, and the horrors endured by our parents' generation. This has to be a top tier. The other film in this double feature from Hell couldn't be more different, and that's of course Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro, the film that produced a character so merchandisable that even Takahata couldn't spend enough money on his weird projects to completely bankrupt the studio, but he did try. Totoro is deliberately aimed at a younger audience than Miyazaki's earlier films, but for my money, this is one of the most watchable little kids movies ever released, no matter how old you are. It's an achingly beautiful portrayal of rural Japan, and although today, every time a boomer makes a movie about how great their childhood was, we tend to roll our eyes. 
In Totoro, you just can't help but fall in love with the nostalgic setting. The script in this movie is word perfect, and even though it's not a long movie at all, every scene plays out like it has all the time in the world. Although there's nothing wrong with the English dub, this is one Ghibli film I watch in the original Japanese every time. I don't know why, it just feels right. There are heaps of standout scenes to pick from. I mean, waiting for the bus in the rain, chasing away the soot sprites, legendary. But in my opinion, when Cat Bus shows up, it's unadulterated joy. This one's our very first god tier. The very next year after Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies were released, Miyazaki managed to squeeze out an entire new film, Kiki's Delivery Service. Perhaps Miyazaki's most underrated film, this is where we first see an in-depth exploration of a theme that would show up time and again in Ghibli films, vocation. Miyazaki is clearly fascinated by the intersection of work and identity, and it's something other Ghibli directors would cover too. In this movie, young witch Kiki has to figure out what it means to be an independent person, and she learns that being in charge of your own life and work is empowering, but it comes at a huge cost. There are certain things that you have to give up forever, and sometimes you don't notice until much later what those are. Of all Miyazaki's films, this is the one that for me changes in meaning the most when you watch it as an adult. Most of us have had that moment where we finally have a job that we trained for, and in the middle of it all we go, wait, is this what my life is going to be like from now on? This movie really digs into what it's like to ask that question, and how to move on from it without losing your mind which I think is pretty impressive for what is supposed to be a simple, easygoing kids movie. A standout scene has to be Kiki's flying tour of the city of Koriko, where she decides to live. The art direction is stunning, and you feel like you can just step into the movie and feel the wind on your face. Kiki's delivery service has to be a top tier. In 1991, we got our second Ghibli film by Isao Takahata. Only Yesterday is a lot less harrowing than Grave of the Fireflies, but it's still not necessarily an easy watch. Have you ever had the experience of reflecting on childhood memories and feeling the rush of positive and negative emotions all at once? I know for me, if I dwell on it too long, my sanity starts to slip. Well, this film is about that experience, and it cuts between two different time periods in the protagonist's life, each using a completely different art style. The childhood memories are pastel and washed out, and the present day scenes are in a dazzling colour palette that has to be some of the best background animation that Ghibli has ever done. Takahata makes absolutely no compromises for his audience, so if a scene doesn't do what you think it's going to do, too bad. You just have to endure it, because Takahata has a lot to say about family, about becoming an adult, about work, and about Japanese society. Sometimes he gives you a message on a silver plate, with no attempt to have it emerge from the storytelling. Other times, it's impossible to know what Takahata is trying to say, because ultimately, I don't think he's trying to be understood. A standout scene is where Toshio and Taeko look over the Yamagata landscape, and local Toshio points out to Taeko, the city dweller, all the ways in which this untouched landscape is actually just as shaped by humans as the city is. There's a lot to love about Only Yesterday, but it's also an opaque, challenging film, so for me, it's in the high tier bracket. The following year, Hayao Miyazaki released a very different film in Porco Rosso, where every scene is fine-tuned for maximum audience delight. This movie is one of the most effortless watches in the whole Ghibli catalogue. It's impossible to dislike. It might have the most flying in it out of all the Miyazaki films. It's here where he really throws away the pretenses and just gives you a whole movie about flying. The relationship between our main hero Porco and the young engineer he takes under his wing, or hoof, Theo is one of the best he ever put on screen. And as usual, the villain is a bit of a dick, but in the end you kind of end up liking him. The standout scene is where Porco tells Fio the story of how he was almost shot down. It's partially a dream sequence and features some of the most tear-jerking imagery in any of these films. Easy top tier for Porco Rosso. In 1993, we got our very first Ghibli movie not directed by Miyazaki or Takahata, and that's the very weird Ocean Waves. Let's count all the weird things about this movie. 1. It was directed by Tomomoi Mochizuki, his only film for Studio Ghibli. 2. It's only 72 minutes long, barely feature length. Three, it was made for TV, not the theatre. And four, to this day there is no English dub, so if you want to watch it, you have to watch it in Japanese. The script for this movie makes no sense. The movie ends out of nowhere. In fact, the whole pacing makes it extremely hard to follow. Some of the plot developments are rage-inducing. Like, I genuinely despise some of these characters. It doesn't feel like a Ghibli film at all. 
although the animation is gorgeous as usual. We get to see early 90s urban Japan from the perspective of teenagers, and I think they do a really good job of transporting you into the setting. This movie is supposed to be a love story, but the main couple the movie wants you to cheer for has zero chemistry. There's much more romantic tension between the main guy and his best friend. They should have made him the romantic interest, maybe this movie would have been interesting. Picking a favourite scene is really hard, because most of them are marred by the nonsensical script, but I really enjoy the scenes where the cast is hanging out at Obiomachi Shopping Arcade, the main shopping street in Kochi where the film is set. Actually, the differences between the cutting edge Tokyo and the more humble city of Kochi, think of it as Japan's Palmerston North, is one of the main themes of the film, but it's all very subtle, and to a foreign audience it's not necessarily obvious, for example, that the characters from each location have completely different accents. This film has no end of issues, and I have to put it in low tier, there's no other way around it. Despite all of that, there's still something about this film that I really like that I can't put my finger on. I'd be keen to hear from anyone who somehow has Ocean Waves as their favourite Ghibli film. 1994 saw the release of the next Isao Takahata film, and it's a masterpiece. Pompoko is a film about tanuki, Japanese raccoon dogs, and their struggle to preserve their habitat in the face of Tokyo's unstoppable suburban sprawl. What this film is famous for is its enthusiastic depiction of the tanuki's huge balls. But what it should be famous for is Isao Takahata's huge balls because of all the insane artistic risks he takes all in one movie. Pompoko is a bizarre mix of hilarious comedy, dead serious drama, and documentary. Every single scene is just a flex from the animation team, who, like in Only Yesterday, are switching between completely different art styles. It's a tour de force of animation mastery. Another theme that comes up time and again in Ghibli films is the clash between the spiritual world and the physical world, but none nails it as hard as this. I don't think many people would describe me as an environmentalist, but watching this film it's hard not to feel the deep anger that the characters are feeling, watching their homes be destroyed and having no way to stop it. Takahata, as usual, alternates between shoving the message in your face and keeping his cards very, very close to his chest. Picking a standout scene is almost impossible, but there's a scene involving a funeral ship near the end of the film that will stay with me a long time. Nobody else in Studio Ghibli is as good at dealing with death as Takahata. Pompoko is heading straight to the gods here. Round about this time, Hayao Miyazaki was in the early stages of planning a movie that would eventually become his magnum opus, but while that project was getting started, he managed to write a script for another movie that he didn't direct. Instead, Yoshifumi Kondo was given the director's role, and it was clear that he was being groomed to be a potential successor to Miyazaki and Takahata when they eventually retired. The movie that resulted was 1995's Whisper of the Heart, another teen drama set in the suburbs of Tokyo. Actually, it's the exact same suburb depicted in Pompoko, just from a human perspective this time. On paper, this movie should be nothing special. The movie's poster tricks you into thinking it's going to be a whimsical fantasy, but that's actually just a dream sequence. Most of the movie is following around dorky, aspiring author Shizuku, and the annoying guy she keeps on bumping into, Seiji. Sounds pretty bland. Well, let's highlight one thing. Shizuku is the lo-fi hip-hop beats girl. This movie is where this gif comes from. In fact, if you've been into Vaporwave or Future Funk in the last 10 years, you have seen many gifs taken from this movie, guaranteed. That's because the aesthetic of this movie is to die for. You can make a gif of practically any scene and stare at it, sobbing, contemplating your life. And it doesn't just look good. The pacing of this film is so perfect, when the plot kicks into gear, it soars. You get scene after unforgettable scene. One of the best and most famous involves Shizuku and Seiji performing a very folky version of a famous pop song. Seiji's grandfather and his friends are watching them, and halfway through the song they join in with their own instruments. It sounds pretty lame, I know, but in the context of the scene, it gave me full body shivers. I was completely blown away by this film, and I think it might be my absolute favourite Ghibli film. Into God's here it goes. The film most responsible for putting Studio Ghibli on the map for Western audiences was Princess Mononoke. Released in 1997, it was the culmination of all of the work Miyazaki had done up until that point, and to this day many consider it his best film. 
In terms of consistency of tone and aesthetic, this is right up there for Miyazaki. Every aspect of the film is dialed in. There's not a single thing that doesn't contribute to the vibe that he wants. It's also much more serious and more violent than any prior Miyazaki movie. So if you're just watching his films in order, this one sticks out. Although I completely appreciate what this film does, for me, it's actually one of my least favorite Miyazaki films. Yeah, probably the most controversial thing I've said in this video so far, and if you just want to hit stop and walk away now, that's totally understandable. My main issue with it is that it takes itself too seriously. There are some humorous moments, but you can really tell that Miyazaki is positioning this film as his important one, and something about that prevents me from getting fully on board with it. The other big problem it has is the existence of Pompoko. Thematically, there's nothing in this film that wasn't also covered in Takahata's film in a more entertaining, more artistically risky way. Both films are fundamentally about the clash of the spiritual and physical worlds, and although I really enjoy the imagery depicting that in Mononoke, Pompoko nails it harder and has more and deeper things to say about it. Anyway, that's just my opinion, so feel free to disregard it. A standout scene is where San takes Ashitaka to the Lake of the Great Forest Spirit. We get some imagery here that seems like it's straight out of Nausicaa, but in even more glorious detail. I don't dislike this film in the slightest, but I can't justify putting it anywhere higher than high tier. After the artistic high mark of Pompoko, you might have expected that Isao Takahata's next film would push the boundaries even further, but for his next project he instead chose to adapt a newspaper comic strip into an almost plotless film that's one of the biggest outliers in the Ghibli catalogue. My Neighbors the Yamadas was released in 1999 and consists of lots of scenes focusing on the hijinks of the Yamada family, but nothing in the way of an overarching story. There's a very lushly animated intro, and the animation picks up again for the finale. But in between, Takahata deliberately veers as far away from his earlier films as he can in terms of look. Everything here is scratchy and cartoony with muted colours. It almost feels like a tech demo, or a test run, for a completely different style of animation that would be perfected in the future. And in hindsight, I believe that's exactly what it was. The scenes in this film, like those in the childhood sections of Only Yesterday, run long and ruminate deeply on the experience of family life. It's a very Isao Takahata film. Lots of scenes where you have no idea what we're supposed to take away from it, and others will have you reeling from how perfectly they encapsulate a universal truth about family dynamics. A standout scene is the opening, which depicts the origins of the very plain, very normal Yamada family as if it's an epic adventure. It's a bit of a misleading start, because after that the energy dies down, and you're in for 104 minutes of very slow, very Ozu-inspired domestic contemplation. I have nothing but love for this film, but in the grand scheme of Ghibli, this is sadly a mid-tier. And just like that, we finally arrived at my very first Ghibli movie, the wonderful Spirited Away. I think that by the time it came along in 2001, Hayao Miyazaki felt like he had succeeded in making his great film in Princess Mononoke, and was now ready to take a victory lap. In fact, he had actually retired after Mononoke, so news of this film came as a pleasant surprise, and probably made everyone think that this would definitely be his last one. Of course, Miyazaki is now famous for his failed retirements. Spirited Away feels like a film made by someone who's relaxed and completely confident in their abilities. I think Miyazaki had fun with this one. The big five tropes are all here in full, unapologetic force. The story of Chihiro accidentally stumbling into the spiritual world is textbook Ghibli, but nothing about it feels like a rehash. Of all the films on this list, this is probably the one you're most likely to have seen, so I'm actually not going to spend that much time on it here. We all know that it's packed to the brim with unforgettable scenes, lovable characters, and breathtaking imagery. It's the only Ghibli movie to have a massively positive critical reception in the West, and frankly I think it deserves every bit of it. I find this movie incredibly moving, in ways that I can't really explain. Picking a standout scene is beyond impossible, but let me shout out the scene I remember from my very first viewing of this film, which made me realise that I was going to be obsessed with it. Chihiro's treacherous descent down to the boiler room. Something about seeing those rickety steps on the side of the bathhouse unlocked something in me and doomed me to be the weeb I am today. No surprise then that Spirited Away is going in the god tier. The Cat Returns is one of the most wacky, hilarious films Ghibli ever put out, and I was not ready for it. Basically, an airheaded high school girl saves a cat from being run over. 
Little does she know that Cat was actually the prince of the Cat Kingdom, and now the Cat King is trying to find her to ensure she is properly rewarded by being married to the prince, who is a cat. Two feline characters from Whisper of the Heart reappear here, and so this film is kind of a loose spin-off, but in a completely different animation style. For some reason, the cats in this film, when they're not being observed by humans, walk upright on their hind paws. It's slightly terrifying and very funny. If you're open-minded enough to watch a Ghibli film that goes way off script and off brand, this movie is a blast to watch, but do be aware that there's a bunch of really dumb things that happen that will cause you to facepalm regularly. My favourite scene has to be the introduction of the Cat King with his extremely over-the-top entourage, voiced by, of course, Tim Curry. Again, I really like this film, but for Ghibli, it's a mid-tier. In 2004, Miyazaki released his follow-up to Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle. The first of several Ghibli films to be based on a western novel, this movie has a very dedicated fan base, and I think that may have something to do with Howl himself, the sexiest manic pixie dream boy in any Ghibli film. It's really hard not to simp for him. But Sophie, our heroine, is a really great character too. Having her be stuck in the body of an old woman for most of the movie works better than you might think, and the brief moments where she returns to her younger self without even realising it are pretty magical. I think this movie suffers a bit from an overstuffed script. It can be quite difficult to keep track of everything going on. This is a sweeping, epic story, just like lots of Miyazaki films, but it's very busy, and for me that takes away from the more intimate vibe that I enjoy in his other movies. If you're looking for the big five Miyazaki tropes, they're all here, again, my favourite scene is when Hal takes Sophie to his picturesque meadow sanctuary, a sickeningly romantic moment dashed quickly by a trademark Miyazaki airship scene immediately afterwards, featuring some of the most diabolical looking steampunk designs ever created. I really like Hal's moving castle, but for me it's not one of the very best, so I think high tier is the right place for it. The next Ghibli film and second adaptation of a western novel was Tales from Earthsea in 2006, and if you haven't seen it, you may be aware that it's the most hated Ghibli film. Or at least it was, but we'll get to that. Author Ursula K. Le Guin thought her novels were going to be adapted by Ghibli legend Hayao Miyazaki, but the studio conveniently left out the first name of their proposed director. Instead, the long and complex book series was placed in the hands of Hayao's son, Goro Miyazaki, who up until this point had had a successful career in... landscape design. Yeah, Goro had never been involved in making a film at all, let alone being a director of a brutally difficult fantasy adaptation. You can probably see why this project was doomed. The movie we got sure is weird. There are lots of elements that appear to have been directly copy-pasted straight from other Ghibli movies without much attempt to hide it. But then there's also some elements that aren't Ghibli-like at all. For example, the main villain, Lord Cobb. Yeah, he's just a really bad guy. Not much depth there. And the script? Good luck making sense of it. There's a plot development near the end that comes out of nowhere, and still doesn't make sense even when it's been explained. The pacing is all over the place, and lots of things that desperately need some time to develop are just glossed over, while other things drag on and on. It's almost like an AI tried to write a Ghibli film. There are, however, two aspects of this movie that do not disappoint. The background art is incredible, some of the best we've ever seen from the studio, and that's saying a lot. The score is so good. Composer Tamiya Terashima apparently didn't get the memo about this film being mediocre because he went hard on the music. My favourite scene is probably when hero Prince Aaron meets up with mage Sparrowhawk and they wordlessly explore a desert of enormous decaying ships. I wanted to like Tales from Earthsea, I really did, but it pains me to admit that this probably is one of the very worst Ghibli films and it does have to go in low tier. After another failed retirement... Hayao Miyazaki emerged again with a brand new film in 2008, Ponyo. The big deal about Ponyo is that unlike all the previous Ghibli films going back to at least Princess Mononoke, this one would have no computer-assisted animation, and as such it's a true love letter to hand-drawn animation. It's one of Miyazaki's most surreal and fantastical films, and I think that's why it has so many fans. Although there's no flying scene in this one, it doubles down on aquatic imagery and there are heaps of scenes that you can watch dozens of times and still notice new details. Nobody does scenes of dense, diverse wildlife like Miyazaki. The English dub though, it's not an easy listen. The main characters are very little kids, and the director of the dub must have encouraged them to be as obnoxious as possible. I'm sure the intended effect was to highlight the energy of childhood, but for me it's just a little too much. One incredible standout scene is when the rainstorm begins and Sosuke leaves his school to go and check on his mother at the old folks' home. 
It's one of the most evocative depictions of a rainstorm I've ever seen. Although I can't deny the visuals of this film as some of the very best of Miyazaki's career, the story doesn't draw me in as much as I want it to, and I think that overall might actually be my least favourite Miyazaki movie. That doesn't mean it's bad in the slightest, it's just up against so many incredible features that it happens to rank last. So for me, this is a mid-tier, but still well worth your time. 2010 saw the debut of another new Ghibli director, Hiromasa Yonebayashi, with his adaptation of the classic novel The Borrowers. Arietti is pretty low stakes, in fact I'd describe the story as being barely there, but the imagery is beautiful and there's so much of it to take in. This one actually has a US and a UK English dub. For some reason, this ended up being one of the most popular Ghibli films in Western markets, so that may be part of the reason why. I strongly recommend watching the UK dub for that proper British experience. Although the setting of the novel is moved to suburban Japan, the movie goes to great lengths to preserve the aesthetics evoked in the book. Something the film smartly emphasises is the existential horror of not knowing whether you're the last of your people or not. It gets pretty dark at some points. A standout scene is Arietti's first borrowing, as she and her father go on a perilous journey through the house to find useful objects to borrow. They really make it seem like a life or death situation, even if they're just trying to break into the kitchen. If this movie had more of a story, I'd rate it higher, but for what it is, it's a comfortable mid-tier. The next year, Goro Miyazaki returned with a second and massively improved feature film, From Up on Poppy Hill. There are two weird things about this film. One, it's a film about hanging on to the past, and I'm still not sure if the conservatism portrayed in the film is an accurate account of the attitudes of early 60s high school students, or if it's actually more a product of the filmmaker's own values in 2011 getting injected into the film, with the characters serving as their mouthpieces. The second weird thing is, uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but let's just say that this fairly straightforward teen drama takes a pretty unexpected turn about halfway through. If you've seen it, you know. Now for me, it didn't end up being that big of a deal. By the end of it, I wasn't bothered in the slightest. There might be some viewers, though, who come out of this remembering nothing else other than that crazy twist. If you aren't bothered by the relentlessly nostalgic vibe of the film, you're in for an absolute treat of post-war Japan imagery. Set in Yokohama in the lead-up to the 1964 Olympics, From Up on Poppy Hill is drenched in period charm that makes you just want to dive into the screen. Being familiar with the story on my second watch, I just coasted through the film marvelling at how great the world building was. A standout scene has to be our first introduction to the high school's Latin Quarter, the rickety old building set for demolition that's lovingly used by the many student clubs. Goro has introduced us to a building almost as memorable as his father's spirited away bathhouse. I give this movie a strong high tier. In 2013, we almost got a repeat of the 1988 Ghibli double bill, because both Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata released films. They didn't end up coming out at the same time, but it's still impossible not to talk about them together, because as of right now, they are the last films by each director. Let's first talk about Miyazaki's film, The Wind Rises. This is actually the very first Ghibli biopic, and Miyazaki's first film set in the real world, so it immediately has quite a different vibe, but the details in the animation make it unmistakably a Miyazaki film. The subject matter was and is pretty controversial, but I think that Miyazaki did an excellent job all things considered. The Wind Rises is the story of Jiro Horikoshi, who designed fighter aircraft for Imperial Japan, aircraft that ended up killing thousands, so not exactly your ideal candidate for a sympathetic biopic, but Miyazaki doesn't shy away in the slightest in confronting the question of whether you can be a good person if your work is used for evil. In fact, Miyazaki confronts an even deeper problem that has clearly bothered him his whole life. How can you enjoy, and even make a living, by drawing cool military machines, when those machines are designed only for killing? If you are looking for a vivid portrayal of pre-war industrial Japan, this film offers tons of it. The sequence depicting the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923 kicks off the story, and from that point onwards, there's no shortage of quite shocking scenes that highlight what life was really like in an empire that only 70 years earlier had been trapped in a feudal time stasis. A big part of the story is the mostly fictional account of Jiro's relationship with his sickly wife, and quite a few critics didn't really like that part of it. For me, I've no issue with it. I think the cutting between Jiro's twin obsessions with aircraft and his wife do a lot to explain who he is as a character. And, of course, who Miyazaki himself is, because he shamelessly inserts himself into this film, to a far greater extent than he ever has before. Although the film is very much centred around Jiro, there is still an incredible cast of side characters, some of the best in any Miyazaki film. 
If you're looking for jaw-dropping scenes of flight, this may just be Miyazaki's most flight-centric movie, perhaps even more so than Porco Rosso. My favourite scene of them all is near the very end. Jiro is told in a dream at the start of the film that a man only has 10 years of greatness, and that Jiro better make the most of his. Well, at the end, there's a moment where Jiro realises that his 10 years are up, and he's forced to confront whether he used his to the fullest or not. It's really powerful and sticks with you long after the film ends. I have no hesitation in putting this in top tier. That brings us to the other 2013 Ghibli film, Isao Takahata's The Tale of the Princess Kaguya. Takahata passed away in 2018, making this his last ever film, and watching it, you can absolutely feel that. Every facet of it is imbued with a sense of impending finality. The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, adapted from a Japanese folk tale, is a haunting meditation on the fleeting nature of true beauty, and it's textbook Takahata the whole way through, full of indulgences that I think are well justified. It's easily the longest of all the Ghibli films, but doesn't drag at all. Its animation style is clearly a refinement of what we saw in My Neighbors the Yamadas, but here is even more stripped down and expressionistic. You can picture Takahata throwing away various rules of animation like, we don't need that, we don't need that. It's actually a really hard movie to talk about. You kind of just have to watch it and sit with it, and I still need to do that several more times before I'm really able to articulate what I think about it properly. I will though talk about the standout scene, which is of course, the final sequence, where Kaguya has to return to where she comes from. This is possibly the most spine-tingling scene in the entire Ghibli canon. It's hard not to see it as Takahata's final, inscrutable, unknowable message to us, as he too leaves this world for the next one. Top tier. Hiromasa Yonebayashi's second film after Arietti is a big step up. Another adaptation of a western novel, When Mani Was There is the only Ghibli film so far that really leans into the mystery genre, and I was hooked as soon as it started. Like From Up on Poppy Hill, this is a movie that can be spoiled, so I'm going to dance around the plot a bit, but let's just say that the first half of this film baits you into thinking that it's going to go in a very different direction. Think Mulholland Drive meets The Shining. Sadly, it takes a big swerve, and what we get is still good, but not nearly as good as it could have been. A lot of people are worried that without Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, that Ghibli won't be able to survive, but films like this make me a lot more confident. A standout scene is the party scene, you'll know it when you get to it. Absolutely entrancing, and worth watching the movie just for that. Easily a high tier. After When Mani Was There in 2014, it looked like Ghibli might be on a permanent hiatus, but then in 2020 we got something new, something very new. Goro Miyazaki re-emerged with a brand new 3D animated movie, Earwig and the Witch. And let me tell you, people hate this movie. It's comfortably dislodged Goro's debut, Tales from Earthsea, as the most despised Ghibli movie. And on the surface, you can see why. 1. Ghibli movies aren't 3D, they're 2D. So this thing looks weird, and you can tell that Ghibli barely knew what they're doing when it came to 3D animation. It almost looks like one of those AI-generated kids videos on YouTube with Spider-Man and Elsa. 2. The script is baffling, with plots left hanging, pacing chaos, and characters that don't exactly behave like normal people. Goro could not have given the critics an easier target, and they have laid into this film like it's an abomination from the pits of hell. I am here to tell you to not write this film off. The animation and script are generally bad, yes, but this film has some things that no other Ghibli film has. Firstly, it's probably the best big screen adaptation of the Roald Dahl aesthetic we've ever seen. Secondly, it's super fun. Our protagonist, Erwig, is a straight up asshole, and it's delightful. This movie is not afraid to be ultra wacky and take every risk it gets the opportunity to take. It doesn't all work, but I can see what Goro's trying to do, and I think he's actually doing amazingly. The scene where a character who you don't think can talk starts talking had me rolling. Remember Disney's first 3D animated film, Chicken Little? Now that is an abomination, way worse than this film. And now Disney's 3D films are beloved by audiences and critics alike. Although I don't think that Ghibli will, or should, abandon 2D films, I think we will see more 3D from them in the future, and I have faith that they'll get a lot better at it. Earwig and the Witch is not a low tier film. It's mid tier, but it's not low. And that brings us to today. Hayao Miyazaki has come out of retirement once more, and who knows when his very definitely final film, How Do You Live, will ever come out, 
and whether it will be able to measure up to the frankly intimidating Ghibli catalog. When it does release, I guess I'll have to update this video, but for now, there it is. All 23 Studio Ghibli films and where I think they deserve to go on my tier list. If you haven't seen all of these films, well, your immediate task is to rectify that, because I'm assuring you that there is no single Ghibli film that is a waste of time. Even the bad ones are memorable, and some of the best ones are the lesser known ones. If you have seen all these films, the good news is that there's a whole lot of Ghibli adjacent movies and TV series to watch, many of which are pretty obscure. I'm currently working through this extra stuff myself and really enjoying it. I just know that there will be people out there who are pissed at my low ranking of Princess Mononoke, so feel free to go off in the comments. If you do end up watching any of these movies because of this video though, thank you so much. That's all I wanted to achieve by making this, and I'd love to hear what you thought. Well, thanks everyone for sticking around to the end, and if you like this video, share it with your Ghibli-loving friends. I hope you're doing well wherever you are and whatever you're doing, and I'm looking forward to us all being able to enjoy a new Ghibli film sometime in the future. I'm sure I'll see you again then.